All right. Well, good morning and welcome again. It is a joy to be able to share God's word and be in this two-part series called More Than a Feeling, where we've been talking about how love is more than a feeling, that we are all about loving God and loving others. And so we're going to talk more about this second part of loving others. And I couldn't help this morning as we've been singing it together, particularly that last song. And as I get ready, as we get ready to study God's word today, God is on the move. And God is at work, and God is working in the hearts and lives of people. And as we think about this series, and as we think about our lives with loving God and loving others, Pastor Rex has said it this way before too, we get to get in on what God is doing, that God is at work, and God does the work in people's hearts and lives. The Holy Spirit moves as we've been singing about this morning as well. And so today, We're going to talk about what that looks like in some practical ways that we're going to put love on display. So last week, I opened up talking about and giving some some music titles and getting into this thought of love and love songs and things like that. But today, I wanted to start with some slogans of some businesses, some restaurants that you all might be familiar with. So we're going to throw these on the screen, and then you're going to be able to guess at it. So have it your way. Wendy's. No, Burger King. Yeah, I heard somebody say Burger King. All right, Burger King. Eating good in the neighborhood. Applebee's. All right. How about Hot Eats Cold Treats? Nobody got this at the nine either. Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen. How many wish we had a Dairy Queen closer? All right. Yes, I know. I love Dairy Queen. All right. Ameri- this is an easy one. America runs on Dunkin. Dunkin Donuts. <laughs> Starbucks. All right. Always fresh, never frozen. Again, people said that at the nine. Wendy's, you would think, but it's Five Guys, right? Wendy's popularized that in their commercial, but Five Guys is, that's their slogan. The next one, come hungry, leave happy. IHOP, IHOP, IHOP. So next one, when you're here, your family. Olive Garden, all right, hey, Grace Fellowship, we'll take that. (laughs) Better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's. Couple more, I'm loving it. McDonald, you know, I said this in the nine too. It probably would have been quicker, better if I would have just went the ba da ba ba ba. Right, you guys get it. Health, happiness, horses, Saratoga. All right, you see that on the signs when you're coming into Saratoga that that's what we are about here as a city, as a spot here on the map. But really, these places are all answering the question: What are you known for? What are you known for is what these slogans really refer to. And this whole concept or whole idea was popularized in a book by uh, Jeff Henderson called Know What You're For. And as we think about this with our lives and loving God and loving others, we're going to answer another question here in just a little bit of what are or what do we want to be known for. But the first thing I want us to think about is what we are known for. And let's face it, Christians, the Christian community can often be more known for what we are against rather than what we are for. That if you ask what Christians hate, you'd probably get some answers. But then if you ask on the flip side, what are Christians all about? From the society at large, it might be a struggle to get a firm answer. And so I think in light of this, we as a Christian community or the Christian community in general has kind of taken some different pendulum swings throughout time. And just in my lifetime, I've seen this pendulum swing a little bit in terms of the Christian community. And there was this season where we were all about, we have to firmly get the message out of Jesus no matter what. We got to cram it down people's throats. They have to know and believe and hear about Jesus no matter what. To the extent of being saying, I don't care if I get called a Jesus freak. All right, anybody know DC Talk fans? Let me see the DC Talk fans, some of you. All right, Jesus freak. Let me read you some of these lyrics from this song. What will people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus freak? What will people do when they find out that it's true? I don't really care if they label me a Jesus freak. There ain't no disguising the truth. So here's the thing, though. The this, this song later goes on. There are some other, there's some other lyrics in the song where it says, there's a guy on the street who had Jesus saves tattooed on his belly, and he's standing on a box saying he's had a dream. All right? Now, you hear that, and you're like, yeah, Jesus freak is fitting. That person's going to be looked on as a crazy person. Now, don't get me wrong. There may be people sitting in this room, and you're like, I heard the, I heard the message of the gospel from a street preacher 
and I came to faith in Jesus Christ, and that's my story. And all praise be to God, and I'm thankful for many people who are declaring the message of Jesus on street corners and places and seeing responses to the message of the gospel. But more often, we see that guy standing on the box with Jesus tattooed across his belly as it says there in the lyrics, and are like, what? What is he doing? And if, if that's Christianity, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not signing up for that. I don't, I don't want to be out there as some Jesus nutcase freak. Like these, these people are off their rockers, right? So we take the pendulum swing. And there was this season, what's known as lifestyle evangelism. The idea being, you know, we're just going to go into our lives and we're going to go into our workplaces and people will just even almost by osmosis, you know, just feel the sense of Jesus that is on us and a part of us. And the phrase often that went with this was by St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. And that is a great phrase and something that we do want to truly be living out the gospel But sometimes I think that can lead to some confusion. I was reading a book recently that was talking about this where there was a guy who was kind of practicing this in his workplace and came to the point where one day somebody said, you know, hey, we'll call this guy Bill. Hey, Bill, you know, I've noticed something about you. It just seems to be a joy and a spark. You know, even even just your demeanor, it almost seems like you radiate a little bit or you have this demeanor. Are you a vegetarian? Right? We laugh about this and we think, oh, that, you know, that's funny and cute, but there's this reality. And what I want us to talk about more today as we put love on display is this reality that we need to find this place and this space where we're considering what are we known for, what do we want to be known for, and that is for putting love on display. For as we talked about last week, loving God with all that we are and putting that on display by how we love God with our time, with our talk, with our thoughts, with our talents, what we do and how we show love for Christ, for God in all that we do with our lives. And then today, how we put love on display to the world around us. So we're gonna go back to Mark chapter 12 where we were last week as kind of our launching point today. And you're gonna see it on the screen or if you've got your Bible or your device, we're gonna pick up in verse 28 where it says this. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, ask him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So we pick up here today, last week we talked about loving God with all that we are, and today we're talking about putting love on display. The second part here in verse 31, where it says, The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The Apostle Paul uses this same phrase in Galatians chapter 5, and I wanted to show you that as well. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14 say, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul here again is giving this same idea, this same reference that you shall love your neighbor as yourself, not in a way of trumping all of the old law, but the law being fulfilled in Jesus in living like him by loving him, loving God with all that we are and loving others. The whole law is fulfilled. And a little background here, what's going on in Galatians is that Paul is speaking to Jews and to Gentiles where the Jews were saying, you need to fulfill the law and be circumcised and live according to the Jewish law that we see in the Old Testament and all the traditions that go along with that, the 613 laws that are given. You need to follow all of those and follow Jesus. And the Gentiles, people who have not been a part of the Jewish tradition are like, wait a second. You're saying I have to have surgery and be physically changed in order to follow Jesus? Like, I'm not jumping on that bandwagon, that train. I'm not doing that. And and Paul is helping just work through all of this and say, 
the whole thing is fulfilled and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. When you're living like Jesus, people will see that in the world around you and understand that you're following Jesus and that the law is fulfilled in Jesus. So that's what we want to talk about the rest of our time here today. As we put love on display, what does this look like in some practical ways? And so I don't know about any of you guys, but for this rest of our time, I thought a way of maybe helping us remember some things. How many of you like acronyms? You're like, I can remember things by giving me a little acronym, a little thing to work with. All right. So you see this frog up on the screen, and the acronym is not frog, all right? It is leap. But even if you say, I don't like acronyms, I'm not an acronym person, likely you might remember this is the frog sermon. So I'm cool with that. Because what I want us to do is be thinking about this word leap, this word leap. And the first word of this acronym is look, look. And you might think, oh, come on, look, that's, that's simple. We look and we see the needs of people around us. Of course, that's gonna be the first way that we love our neighbor as ourself. But let's be honest, this isn't always easy. Even if you would think, I'll just ask for a show of you. How, do you, how many of you would say, I'm a pretty observant person. I, I think I'm pretty observant. I kind of keep an eye on things around me. Show of hands, some of you guys. All right, some of you guys. See, I wondered if I would see more ladies than men as well. You know, wait, women seem to be more observant. Um, that's just a reality. How many of you asked another question or show of hands where like, listen, it depends on the scenario. Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. Any people like that? All right, some of you, because I've heard stories, and I'm sure some of you could tell stories where, you know, if, like, especially married people, you're like, you know, husband is like, you know, my wife asked me to look for this, find this, and I'm like, ah, I can't find it. But then it's like, I go out to my garage, and I can tell you where every single tool is, all right? Or I go out to my vehicle, I can tell you where, how everything is supposed to be perfectly dialed in, and you focus on those things. Well, this is true, and this is even in big parts of our lives. I'll just tell you guys a quick story. Even This happened to me this week. I, I would consider myself, I think, pretty observant, you know? But so we get a, a deal recently. There was a, a TV on sale. We're like, okay, we'll, we'll get it ordered, and it'll get shipped here. So it was supposed to order, I mean, arrive on Wednesday. So I had in my mind, Wednesday, it's going to show up. We'll get the whole thing set up. It'll be good to go. So I come home from work on Tuesday, and I walk into our family room, and my wife's there, and she looks at me, and then she kind of gives the like, hey, look over there, look. And so I look, and our kids are all sitting there watching TV. And I'm looking, and I look back at her with the, uh, so are the kids doing something funny, or is it supposed to be something on the show? Ah, and so she gives me the, are you blind? Look again, kind of a look to which I look and go, ah, the TV. And much to her uh, bewilderment or whatever, I, I didn't exactly, wasn't exactly super excited because I was embarrassed, let's be honest. I thought I was observant. And not only do we have a new TV, she had completely rearranged the room to make it more functional. And I was just like, ah. So we can easily do that in our own personal lives. And we see this happen in, in scripture as well. You think about, how many of you, just by show of hands, so I'll recap it real quick, but know the Good Samaritan story. Anybody, you guys, all right, heard the Good Samaritan story, so I'll give just a, a brief recap. If you're unfamiliar with the story, you can find it in Luke chapter 10, where there's a person who's going along, is robbed, is beaten up, left for dead, and two religious leaders walk right by. And sure, they may have had their reasons, maybe they even saw him there, but they had their reasons for not actually looking, actually seeing with the eyes of Jesus. But the Samaritan comes along and he stops and he helps. He bandages the wounds and he takes the person to an inn and he tells the keeper, whatever his, need, whatever his needs are, when I come back, I'll pay you for everything. And Jesus is answering the question uh, to this lawyer about who is showing and being neighborly. And the lawyer says, well, it seems like the Samaritan. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. You see, we want to and need to have the eyes of Jesus in every part of our lives. And we see in 1 John chapter 3, something that points to this as well. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. 
See, the word I use is look, but we want to look with the eyes of Jesus and respond in a loving kind of way. We want to look with the eyes of Jesus and see the needs of people around us. And as this passage says in 1 John, we see the needs and then it says, let us love not in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So likely, going back to the Good Samaritan story, if you would have asked those religious leaders, they would say, oh yeah, I, you know, I prayed for the guy. I care, you know, I thought about the person but I just didn't take action in the moment. So it's looking with the eyes of Jesus and taking action to respond. Sometimes it may just be a word of encouragement and prayer. And that's what our second word is, is encouragement. It may just be a moment that you pause and you share that encouraging word to the people around you, to someone that is close to you. And this is both for those who are followers of Christ and those who are not followers of Christ. In Colossians chapter three, it says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I talked about this last week a little bit, how we want to use and be so just filled with the word of God in our lives that it's indwelling, it's dwelling in us richly so that when we come together, we are pouring out our hearts to God and praise to him with thanksgiving because of all that he has done in our lives and all that he is and all that he means and our focus is completely on him. So now as we think about giving those encouraging words, this is both to those who are followers and close around to us and to those who are far from God. But when we come together, we're singing And we're just praising God for all that he is. And then, with these words of encouragement, we're sharing the truth of the gospel. And we read this in 1 Peter chapter 3, where it says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. I love this verse because it tells us a lot of things about being encouraging here. And the first part, it says, honor Christ as holy, being prepared to make a defense. And now, this is where many people will stop. And it goes back to that pendulum I was talking about at the beginning where it's like, okay, we just got to have a defense. We got to be able to stand up for the faith. We got to be able to, you know, just stand firm in our Christianity no matter what comes our way. But if you keep reading, it says, to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that's in you. See, because the problem, I think, sometimes is what I referred to earlier. People will see our defense for the gospel and what we would think is holy living and holy. I got to just be a zeal for Christ and come across as abrasive and brash. But we should have people asking us, why is it that you have more hope? Why is it that you're filled with joy? I see this fruit that we would describe as the fruit of the spirit, this love, this joy, this peace, this patience, this kindness, this goodness, this gentleness, this self-control that's different than other people. Why is that? And then it says, then you can give a reason for that hope and do it with gentleness and respect. Our demeanor is gentleness and respect for the people around us and where they're coming from and what they've known about Christians or people and really caring where they're coming from. And that leads us to our third word, which is acknowledge. So we're looking, we're encouraging, and then we're acknowledging. We're acknowledging where people are coming from. We're listening into what's going on in their lives, truly showing that we do care. We care about people's lives. We care about what's going on in their lives. We're acknowledging the circumstances that they find themselves in. And I love how Philippians describes this in Philippians chapter two. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. If we're honest, myself included, we can have moments where we feel selfish. We can live selfishly thinking about our own interests first. And this verse tells us, these verses tell us, look not only to your own interests, not only. There are things we have to worry about in our lives and how we figure out our lives and our family lives. But it says, don't look only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. It takes true humility 
to put others first. And that's why I use this word and we talk about this as acknowledging people and acknowledging where they're at and where they're coming from. You know what this takes? It takes a true heart of love from Jesus Christ. And that's what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's often referred to as the love chapter with this list of what love looks like. And you see it here, it says, love is patient and kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all all things. Love never ends. See, acknowledging where people are at and responding and listening in a helpful and hopeful way takes love. When we think about putting love on display for people around us, whether that's in your family, maybe your coworkers, your friends, your actual neighbors that live in your neighborhood and around you, at times that's not going to be easy. At times, we want to be selfish. And we go, oh, man, I, I don't have time. I've got other things to worry about. But love says, I'm going to be patient. Love says, I'm going to be kind. Love says, no matter what these people say, or maybe they're even critical of Christianity, maybe they're critical of who I am, love hopes all things. And love endures all things. And we keep holding on to that love that comes from God alone. And we pour out that love on others, even when we don't feel like it. See, that's what makes love for God and love for others more than a feeling. We don't always feel like expressing this love that goes out of our own way and love that takes work but when we do, when we lean into these moments, as I started with saying, God is at work, and we get to dive in on what God is doing and partner in seeing hearts and lives changed with a message of hope and joy. And that is what it means to acknowledge others. And one of the greatest ways we can acknowledge and love people for who they are and where they are is to be praying to be praying. So you think about this acronym of LEAP, and this last word is to pray, pray, pray. Prayer is an incredible tool. You could use the word weapon. I'm gonna take us to Ephesians chapter six, where the armor of God is given in this passage, and then we come to the later part of Ephesians chapter six, and starting at verse 18, it says this, praying, at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I'm an ambassador in chains, chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So Paul is speaking here again, speaking to the church at Ephesus. And he uses in this verse 18 in particular, this word all, four different times, praying at all times with all prayer. That means all kinds of prayer, all types of prayers and supplication. And he says, keeping alert with all perseverance and then making supplication for all the saints. That we go to prayer as a tool and as a weapon to put love on display in the world around us. And Paul's prayer here, and he says, this is for all the saints and for himself, that he may have boldness to declare the message of Jesus Christ. And, and at this point, it's cost him. It's put him in prison. He says, I'm an ambassador in chains. This has cost Paul. But he writes this letter and he says, I want to carry out the mission of the gospel and what Jesus has called me to in my life here on this earth. And I'm praying this, praying this for all the saints. And I long for you to pray for this, for all the saints, that we would declare the message of the gospel. And we want to do this with our lives and with our words. 
And it says, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Not boldly and harshly and in a, a brash way, but in a loving and gentle and respectful way so that people hear the hope and the message of the gospel, that people see and hear and recognize that God is at work. And they watch our lives and they see our lives and go, wow, something is different. And we go, yeah, it's Jesus and the hope that I have in him. If you've been around Grace for any length of time, you know that we are about making more and better disciples of Jesus Christ. And what that means is we want to see people taking their steps in their journey of faith, of following Jesus with all that they are. And then we want to see people growing better in their walk with God, taking their next steps in following him and chasing after Jesus. And one of these is to put love on display in these practical ways that we can look out and see others. We can give words of encouragement. We can acknowledge and we can pray. And so what I want us to do today, as I wrap up the message, I want us to spend some time praying as a congregation for our community, for our neighbors, that we would show the love, that we would show the message of Jesus Christ with our lives, and that we would speak the words of truth, and that we would come alongside, that we would see, that we would encourage, that we would acknowledge that that's what we would do with our lives. And so I'm going to have the band come out here. And as they come and are just starting to just play some, some soft music, I want to just put up on the screen here for us a list of things that we're going to be praying for. We're praying for God to work in the hearts of those around us. We're praying for God to give us his eyes to see people around us. We're praying for him to give us words of encouragement. We're praying that he would help us acknowledge some, and come alongside in some tangible ways. And we're praying for boldness to declare the mystery of the gospel, even if it costs us something. And I want to just give us some time to just lean in and be praying. I'm going to pray to get us kicked off here. And then I want to just let you guys be where you are. And maybe you want to stay seated. Maybe you want to kneel down. Maybe you want to just whatever it looks like for you. Maybe you want to stand. Maybe whatever this looks like for you, I want us to just go to God. And maybe you're here, if you're here today and you're just checking out church and you're just here for the first time and you're like, this is crazy, okay? <laughs> That's okay. I would love for you to be just right where you are, observe as we take this time to pray. And then maybe you are for the first time seeing Christians who are going to God on behalf of others and praying that God would work, that the Holy Spirit would move in a mighty way, in our homes, in our community, in our area, for God's glory and the good of others, that we would be used by God. So as we go to prayer, I wanna pray the lyrics of a song, it's called Available. As we go to prayer, just listen to these words, for the one who gave me life, Nothing is a sacrifice. Use me how you want to, God. Have your throne within my heart. I hear you call. I am available. I say, yes, Lord, I'm available. It's my joy to say yes to you. It's my honor to say yes. Whatever it looks like, my response is yes. My response is all that I am. All that I am. Let the sound of surrender fill the room because we love, we love, we love. We say yes, Lord, we love you. We give you everything we have. We give you everything we are. God, it's my prayer that my life be an offering. So if you can use anything, God, you can use me. Come, have your way. Use me how you want to. God, that is our prayer. And as we spend these moments in prayer right now, we pray that you would just have our hearts. You would capture us in a new way. 
So God, this is our prayer. We love you. Let's continue to pray as the band plays for a few moments and then we'll continue worshiping through song.